Amen. 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 Well, here it is Wednesday night. That must mean it's time for a Wednesday night faith lift here at Beacon Hill Church. <laughs> thank God, thank God that we get to be a beacon on a hill, a beacon of hope. Hope, man, hope is alive and well here, isn't it? Faith is alive and well here. Glory to God. Love is alive and well here. Oh, praise the Lord. What a great time to be alive. What a great, confusing, perplexing time to be alive. <laughs> but you know what? There's no confusion with the things of God. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Uh, I want to read something to you and with you as we get ready to launch into this uh, Wednesday night message. And I'm going to start over in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians in the 12th chapter. And I just want to show you something here uh, very quickly. So if I speak fast, you just listen in a hurry. All right, praise the Lord. If I slow down, then you can slow down. But 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and Paul says this in verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren. All right, so we know that he's addressing the brethren or the believers, okay? And really the epistles are letters to the church to believers, okay? Uh, this is an epistle or a letter. And he says, I would not have you ignorant. He doesn't want you to be ignorant concerning uh, something. And he says in verse 2, you know that you were Gentiles carried away under these dumb idols, even as you were led. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. And then he goes on and he says, now there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God, which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Now, he's obviously going to be speaking about the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And he says, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren. And he's going to let us know here, uh, basically then, what we're going to do is see, and I'll read these to you in just a moment, we're going to see that there are nine manifestations or nine spiritual gifts. Nine manifestations or nine spiritual gifts. Uh, they are operated through us, and it's as the Spirit wills. And he says, the verse 7, the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. And here we go. For to one, verse 8, for to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. The word of wisdom. To another, the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, diverse kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh at one and the selfsame spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. Now, if we're going to categorize these, there are three manifestations or three gifts that say something. Three that do something and three that reveal something. That's a neat classification. The word of wisdom, the word of knowledge. Uh, you have also faith, the gifts of healing, uh, working of miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits, different kind of tongues, and interpretation of tongues. These are manifestations of the Spirit. We want these. We want these in manifestation in our gatherings. We want them when we come together corporately like this. We want the Holy Spirit to manifest. And we don't, we don't want it to just be a doctrine or a lesson in a book. We want this to happen and we want to experience it. We want the manifestations. We want the manifestations. And notice, notice again it says, um, go all the way down to verse, the last verse, verse 31 in that chapter. But covet earnestly the best gifts. Now, you know in the, uh, uh, the Old Covenant, the Ten Commandments were not supposed to covet certain things, right? Here he says, covet earnestly 
the best gifts. Well, what would be the best gifts? Well, I guess, I guess it depends on what we need at the time. Right? So, the gifts that we need at the moment or at the time to be a blessing and to profit us and to help us, we need those. That might be considered the best gifts. He says, covet earnestly. We need to go after these things because here's the thing. If you're coveting something, you know, you're, you don't just have a, a casual thought once in a while. What is one of the ten commandments? It talks about not coveting what? Somebody else's wife, right? So if you're going to covet somebody's wife, it wasn't just a passing thought that happened once, a, you know, uh, back in 1928. You're actually setting your mind on it. You're thinking about it. You're fantasizing about it. Uh, okay, is this okay? Uh, you, you're adults here, right? Well, if you're coveting earnestly the best gifts, you get your mind set on it. You're going after it. You're thinking about it. You're fantasizing about it. Not in a bad way, not in a, a goofy, a perverted way. But I think about these things. I could see the Holy Spirit manifesting in here. I think about it happening. I see you being ministered to, and I see you being blessed. I see these gifts in operation, and I see someone getting a, a word of knowledge. Something that the Holy Spirit shows and reveals that, hey, by the Spirit of God, I'm saying this to you. A lot of times, you know, you'll hear me call out something, hey... Uh, right shoulder or a, a left knee or somebody's having this issue or that and somebody goes oh that's that's me well, how did you know that where'd you get that word of knowledge from well, I got it from the Holy Spirit I'm not smart enough to know these things um, I like the fact that it talks about the working of miracles man the working of miracles I I dream about the working of miracles happening here where people come in and they need a creative miracle maybe maybe eyes that aren't even there and, and eyes grow and we come together and, and and maybe somebody's never been able to hear a day in their life and 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 all of a sudden they they have the ability to hear the working of miracles Man, I'll tell you what, limbs growing out. Oh, pastor, that's old-fashioned stuff. Is it really? No, it's present day now. It's supposed to be present day now stuff. Really, our services, this, is, this should be characteristic of the, of the New Testament church. And I'm sorry to say this to you, but what's char what characterizes the New Testament church today is not this. You know that, you know it's true. You might as well just say amen. If you can't say amen, say oh me. Now back up, if you would, to the book of Acts. The Acts of the Apostles. The book of the Acts of the Apostles is called the Acts of the Apostles because the Apostles acted. And they didn't just sit there and twiddle their thumbs and say, oh, thy kingdom come. Let's pray all day and all night and do nothing. No, you've got to get out there and do something. There's a time for praying and then there's a time for action. You know, General, what if our troops out there just prayed all the time that God would protect us and deliver us and never picked up a weapon and went to work? How would that, how would that go for us? Not well. Not well. Thank God our military doesn't have that philosophy. Thank God for our military. Thank God for our military. Amen. The book of the Acts of the Apostles, the beginning of the Spirit-filled church. Now, I started off by telling you that, you know, we need to have manifestations of the Holy Spirit. We can't fabricate them. We can't make it happen. You can't just come up with it and whip up, you know, come in here and wave a magic wand. It's as the Spirit wills, but the Spirit does will. Right? And it is the will of God for the Holy Spirit to manifest, to profit with all. To advance, to, to progress, to there's, there's so many facets to what the Holy Spirit does that there's no way I can cover that in one Wednesday night session. It won't even happen the rest of this month. I can't cover everything this month. I'd like to be able to try, and maybe we will someday. But let me show you this in chapter 1 of the book of Acts. It says this, uh, oh, let's, let's begin here. Let's just start at verse 1. The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up. 
after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So after Jesus was raised back from the dead, he spent forty days on the earth and it's speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So a little more than a month he was here before he went back to heaven. That's a pretty cool thought, isn't it? It's like, man, he stayed, he, he hung out a little bit longer before he went back. And being assembled, verse 4, chapter 1, verse 4, being assembled together with them, he commanded them, he didn't suggest, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Now, if we're going to have all the manifestations of the Holy Spirit that I opened up with, this is the entry level right here, what we're going to talk about. This is the beginning and this is the entry level. And this wasn't just for the beginning of the church. The, you know, the, the church needed this to get started. Well, no, 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 no. This, this is still valid today. And in, in verse, it says here, uh, verse number 8, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Well, I don't know about you, but we need power. The times that we're living in are treacherous and perilous, and they're getting worse. The closer we get to the end, the Bible says it's going to get worse. So be of good cheer, church. It only gets worse from here. But we can meet the challenge. We can rise to the occasion. You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me. You shall be witnesses unto me, he says, both in Jerusalem, Jerusalem speaking about locally, and then he says, and in all Judea and Samaria, which talks about a cross-cultural influence and sphere, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Now we're speaking internationally. Witness is an evidence producer. A witness produces evidence. What kind of evidence are we producing that Jesus is alive and well and that he equipped and empowered us? What evidence do we produce? We have amazing music. Well, that's wonderful. You know, we have good looking worship leaders. Well, we just saw two of them up here earlier. The king and queen of the prom. But see, it's got to go further than that. It's got to be more than we got great entertainment. It's got to be more than we have good programming. It's got to be more than we got good looking worship leaders. It's got to be something from out of this world. It's got to be spiritual because the battles that we're waging or the, 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 the challenges that we have are spiritual in nature. Spiritual forces are the most uh, powerful forces on the planet. You know that they are. The spiritual force of jealousy, it just goes beyond logic and reason. It causes people to do nutty things, right? Envy, love, hate, you name it. These are spiritual forces and they transcend all logic and reason. People do nutty things under the influence of spiritual things. So if we're dealing with spiritual problems, they certainly will require spiritual solutions and not just a half-hearted attempt to throw uh, a doctrine at it. Oh yes, we believe in the doctrine of the Holy Ghost. We have the doctrine and we have the... Listen, he said, you're going to receive power and then you're going to be able to be witnesses or evidence producers, okay? And so uh, he goes on, let me just show you this. Uh, just turn the page to chapter 2. Moving right along, I love this, chapter 2, verse 1, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly, suddenly, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. Verse 4 says, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Hmm. Yes and amen. And I know that the church is very divided on this issue. 
This is one of the issues where we're divided on. And what we're not to do is to argue or debate with our brothers and sisters who think that this is not for today. You can't deny that it's in the Bible, but see, as long as, as, long as it was necessary for the church then, then it excuses us of our responsibility today to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. Oh, I cooperate with the Holy Spirit. Do you really? Do you really? Because cooperating with the Holy Spirit means you're going to have to submit. You're going to have to crucify your flesh. It means you're going to have to die to yourself. It really means you're going to have to go and be uncomfortable. Because when the Holy Spirit's in manifestation, it certainly can make people very uncomfortable. Now, I like this because he goes on and it says, you know, there were dwelling. Now, don't forget, this is the big uh, uh, feast of Pentecost. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem in verse five, Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Uh, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and they were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and they marveled and they said one to another, behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? And it goes on and it lists the different languages that were being spoken here. Verse 11, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, what meaneth this? Others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. <laughs> but good old Peter Verse 14, he stood up with the eleven, he lifted up his voice, and he said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass. And he goes on and he talks about uh, what Joel had said. This was an experience that took place and caused quite the stir in the community okay now over to chapter uh, if you wouldn't mind chapter 8 beginning of the spirit-filled church if you would honestly sit down with the book of acts sometime and just start here and work your way through it and look at the church look at what happened look at the manifestations look at the results look at the tactics and the strategies now understand this, they didn't have seminars and conferences to go to. I mean, we have the advantage of being educated and progressive and everything else, and we're hip and we're cool. We got all kinds of things going for us, don't we? But here, they didn't have anything but the Holy Spirit and each other. I only wish we could go back to that time when we had nothing but the Holy Spirit and each other. I only wish, my wife and I were talking about this, in fact, we talk about this all the time, if we could only go back to pre-internet, pre-Facebook, and excuse me, folks there, <laughs> I don't mean to erase this, what I mean is that we're so connected that we're disconnected. I don't know about you, but when I sit down with somebody and we have meetings together, I actually think that we're there to have meetings with each other, not with everybody on their phone that they need to stay connected to. Well, because if that's the case, then we should have brought them in on the meeting. You know, it's, it's as if, well, what you're telling me is that, well, they're more important than you right now. I got to put you on hold so I can deal with this. If it's an emergency, I get it. But when I see people scrolling on their Facebook while we're sitting in a meeting, I'm like, you dirty dog. I, who called this meeting? <laughs> if I recall correctly, you did not. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I'm just messing with you. You realize that. Oh, here are the crickets. Boy, did he get quiet in here. Mm. What I'm saying to you is this. Let's be perfectly clear about what I'm saying. I think we have become so advanced and so smart that we have lost touch with the basic source of power. I really, I really believe that. I really believe that we have lost touch with our basic source of power. I, I think that the strategy has always been the same. Rely on the Holy Spirit. It's amazing what the church in America can do without the Holy Ghost. We've got education. We've got education out the wazoo. We've got programs and we've got talent and we've got good looks and we've got all kinds of stuff. 
But I'm looking for a man and I'm looking for a woman that is in tune with the Holy Spirit, that draws their source, their power directly from the source. There's a difference, isn't there? And so the first deacon uh, or the first martyr of the church, Stephen, was a deacon. A deacon. A deacon. Someone who served and helped in the church. That's the first martyr of the church. And after they killed Stephen, I want to pick up the story here because the guy that wrote half of your New Testament, the guy that wrote half of your New Testaments in, ver in chapter 8 of the book of Acts, verse 1, and Saul was consenting unto Stephen's death. That's, Saul is the guy that wrote half of your New Testament. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house. And at some scriptures say he hauled men and women. He, he committed them to prison. He dragged them. He dragged these men and women, believers. He dragged them out of their home and threw them into prison. This was Saul of Tarsus doing this before he became Paul the Apostle. It was hazardous to your health to be a believer. In fact, all throughout the book of Acts, I don't know, there's something, there's something that I, I, I don't quite know how to articulate this, but, and I'm going to use a word that may upset people, General, I'm just going to have to do it, so everybody's going to have to forgive me. Man, we become a bunch of sissies. We like it easy. We like it comfortable. Who wants to wait in line at Starbucks? Not me. Uh, and when we go to Chick-fil-A and there's a long line, it's like, oh, forget this. But, you know, my wife and daughter, oh, it goes quick, Dad. We are sissies. We're sissified. That's pointing the fingers at me. And, oh, heaven forbid that my chicken sandwich isn't hot. Wait a minute. I'm paying good money here. And my coffee better be done just right. I'm just going to reveal a little something here. A time or two, well, more than a time or two, my wife and I have gone to a different Starbucks location after we got coffee at another Starbucks because they didn't do it right. So we went to the next one and complained and had them redo it. <sighs> do you see that this attitude is in the church? Of course it is. Of course it is. But these believers were being dragged into prison for no other reason than they were believers. Okay? You with me? I don't like the crickets I'm hearing. Therefore, verse 4, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere into hiding. Oh, wait a minute. I'm sorry. Maybe I have a different Bible. Let me, let me, let me check this out, Matthew, Stephen. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Preaching the word. It says the beginning of chapter 8 says a great persecution against the church. This was a time of great persecution. The best thing, Bert, that could ever happen to the church is trouble. Trouble. You want to know why? Andy, trouble brings out the best in us. It brings out the best in us. It causes us to align our priorities and say, you know what? My Starbucks being just right isn't the priority in life. My chicken sandwich, uh, these things are not the priority. Are they important? Of course, I like to have my chicken and I like my coffee and I like my burgers and blah, 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 blah. But when it comes right down to it, we've got to get back. We've got to get back to where things make sense. We've got to get back to where things make sense. And trouble has a way of bringing out the worst and the best. And so they went and preached the word. When they were scattered because of persecution, they didn't go into hiding. They looked at it as an opportunity. Well, fine, I'm going to preach the word here. And I'm going to preach the word there. And watch this now in verse number five. Man, we're running out of time rapidly here. Philip went down to the city of Samaria. Now, this is Philip. This is one of the original 12, I think, right? Help me out here. Correct me if I'm wrong. 
uh, I, I know that uh, Philip was a, 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 an original apostle, right? Am, am, am I right? Okay. Uh, I have to double check myself because uh, sometimes I get excited and, and I lose track of things. He went down to the city of Samaria and he preached Christ unto them. That word Christ means anointed, the one anointed, the anointed one. He didn't preach religion, denominationalism. He preached Christ. Christ. And Christ is not the last name of Jesus. It was Jesus the Christ. Jesus the anointed. Jesus the one with the ability of God. Jesus the Messiah. Jesus the Son of God. And the people, verse 6, with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Well, evidently, there were miracles that were being done. God confirms his word with signs, wonders, and miracles following. If you're, if you're not having, listen, signs, wonders, and miracles in your gatherings and in your church, check up on what you're preaching. Because God will confirm the word of God. If you're preaching Christ, if you're preaching the miraculous, you'll have them. You'll have miraculous. You'll have those things. Uh, and it says here in verse 7, For unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. Is there any doubt in your mind, and we're going to have to hurry because I've got to get to something a few verses away. Is there any doubt in your mind that there was, maybe we could say, a revival that hit that city? Something that was spectacular. They received the word. They received the Lord Jesus. There was the preaching of the God. I mean, everything, all the components and, and all that we would consider necessary were happening here because there was great joy in that city. And it, look at verse 13. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women, further proof that this was a genuine experience. It wasn't just sensationalism. It wasn't just sensationalism. It was a genuine experience because they were baptized now, which is what you do as a public profession of your faith. This is what gets other uh, other cultures, this is what gets them into trouble. When they go ahead and get follow through with baptism, then you are really identifying yourself with Christ, with the Christ of Christianity. Now watch as we rapidly conclude. It says, verse 13, Then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, and continued with Philip, and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done, Miracles and signs were being done. They were baptized. There was great joy in that city. This city was rocking and rolling with the word of God. But now we'll look at verse 14. When the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. Peter and John. You know those two, right? Who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. What, what, did they, what did they come for? That, so that they could receive the Holy Ghost. Yeah, but I, I thought they received Jesus. They did. Well, what do these guys have to come and follow up for with this Holy Ghost stuff? Because when you receive Jesus, you get the Holy Ghost. Do you? In one sense, in one sense you, yes. In another sense, no. Did, did Samaria receive Christ? Yeah. Was, were they baptized? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, was there great joy? Yeah, were there mere, yeah. Things were happening. They received the Lord Jesus. But now, for some reason, the apostles sent Peter and John so that they could pray for them and they would receive the Holy Ghost. Verse 16, oh, what's this one? For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Who was fallen upon none of them? The Holy Spirit. Well, what is that? Something separate. Evidently, a separate experience, something extra, as someone once said to me. It's a little something extra. In verse number 17, then laid they their hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. Huh. And when Simon saw that through the laying out of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. 
What did he see? How do you see the Holy Ghost coming on somebody? See, what I'm saying to you is this. You know, we pray, we want the manifestations, we want the things that the Spirit of God will do. But when we start reading stories like this, and we can't quite remedy that with our mind, then we just say, well, that was good for them back then. They needed this. But today, we're advanced. We have doctrine today. Hmm. We have the Bible today. See, this, they didn't have the whole Bible to read. No, <laughs> they were living the Bible. They were living it. See, that's the difference today. We're not living it. We're reading it. We're reading about it. And, 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 and we've, we've reduced it down to a historical document. The Bible is not a historical document, man. It's the living word. And so Simon saw that when the apostles laid their hands on, on these people, the Holy Ghost was given. He offered them money because he said, man, I want to be able. He says, saying, give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. We need the Holy Spirit. We cannot do the work that we've been called to do without the Holy Spirit. This is my summary. And I've got, to, I've got to conclude this. Because we're just about out of time. We might think that we're operating in the power of the Holy Spirit. But many people are self-deceived and deluded. We have to... We've got to make this a priority. We've got to under, well, how do we operate in the power of the Holy Spirit? How, how do we cooperate with the Holy Spirit? What, wh why do we need the Holy Spirit? Well, Jesus seemed to think that you could be an evidence producer or a, witnesses a, a witness after you receive power. That, that you're not really going to be able to produce the evidence that he needs us to produce before you receive the power. But the power that is being produced, the power source is the Holy Spirit. And see, we're tapped into education, and we're tapped into music, and, and we're tapped into this, we're tapped into that, we're tapped into one thing or another, but are we tapped into the power source? Oh, yes, we are. I tell you, when, when my praise and worship leader gets, oh, the, go oh, the goosebumps that get all, oh, oh, oh. The Holy Ghost is not the one in charge of the goosebump department. I get goosebumps when I watch scary movies. That ain't the Holy Ghost. Hmm. Praise the Lord. Maybe it's time for us to get back to basics. Maybe, maybe everything that we are building and establishing in his name really isn't all that we think it is. I don't know about you, but at the end, a lot of things are going to get burned up. And what, that's what I read in my Bible, is that a lot of the things that we present to him are going to get burned up. And only that which is genuine will remain. Lord, look at everything we did in your name. Andy and I were talking about this earlier, and at one point, the Lord says, I never knew you. whoop did he do Number two, look at all that you did for me in my name, but I never knew you. Wow. I wonder how many ministers are going through the motions. They're professionals. They are professionals, and rightfully so, but they don't really know him. The God that they preach and teach about, but they don't really know him. I'm just saying, I'm wondering. See, that would, be a, that would be a grave mistake on my part to just be talking about him and preaching to you about him, but I really don't know him or experience him intimately myself. And, and that's my conclusion. It comes back to you and him, doesn't it? If he thinks that you need the power of the Holy Spirit, then who are you to think otherwise? And, and who, who am I as a preacher to tell you otherwise? When you receive Jesus, you got all the Holy Spirit there is. That's not true, folks. That is inaccurate. And I don't have the time to give you more evidence, but I gave you enough to chew on, didn't I? Oh, glory to God. Praise the Lord. Well, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for showing us, Lord God, how to maximize our potential. Thank you, Father God, for showing us how to tap into the power source. Father God, that we have an unlimited supply of power. Lord God, we do not lack. We, we are never without. And so, Father, help us. Help us to accurately represent you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen and amen.